Welcome to U.S. Farm Report, a public information program brought to you in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation by members of the National Farmers Organization in this local area. The National Farmers Organization takes pride in inventing a marketing system to meet the needs of the 20th century, collective bargaining for agriculture. NFO represents new thinking in a new generation of farmers. U.S. Farm Report presents Quality Community by Design with the moderator, Willis Rowell, and the guest, Reverend E.W. Mueller, a staff member of the Department of Church and Community Planning, Lutheran Council in the United States of America, Chicago. Certainly, the U.S. Farm Report today is very privileged to have a man like Dr. Mueller, uh, Reverend Mueller, with us uh, on U.S. Farm Report. We'd like to visit with you today about a very thought-provoking and I feel a very timely subject uh, concerning our rural communities, our rural areas, quality of, com of community by design. So to get right into the discussion, Reverend Mueller, uh, how, do, how do you think this quality of community by design really means to rural America? Well, I want to start with the word design. That uh, ever since the turn of the century, Rural America has been in transition. And that I mean it's been changing. And it's been changing very rapidly since 1910, and then particularly since the Second World War. And the rural communities are changing and moving from one stage to another. But in a sense, they are not developing because no one seems to have any design as to what rural America is to be like. I would say that at this particular point, uh, we don't even want to project what rural America of 1980 or 2000 is going to be like. Yet if we're going to build quality community, to my mind, somebody, and particular rural people, ought to have an idea as to what type of a community or countryside they're projecting. Well, we do see a good deal of a confusion. Uh, we seem to lack a sense of direction in our farm communities, in our farm-based towns. Uh, no, no one seems to know exactly where they're heading. So perhaps we should look back a while, a few years, and see what are some of the factors, Reverend Mueller, that could contribute to this type of confusion and, and lack of direction. I would say the reason that there seems to be a lack of direction and confusion, as you refer to it, I think is largely due to the fact that rural people are not in control of their destiny. They don't seem to be in the position to determine what rural America is going to be, be like. And one reason they're not in control of their destiny is because they're not in control of the economic base of rural America. Because they are not in a position, at least at this point, to be able to put a price tag on the human effort that people spend. Or put another way to put a price tag on the farm product. So no one quite knows what the future is going to be or how much uh, people are going to be able to pay for their various services. Now, young people are not tied to rural America. And young people that grow up in rural America are people of uh, skill, they have capabilities, they are uh, talented, and they're not just going to stay in rural America because it's rural, but they're going to go where they can get the most return for the human effort that they invest. And consequently, we have this constant decline of the countryside. And uh, quality countryside is not the result of accident. <coughs> if we're going to have a quality countryside, it's going to be because people have purpose, people have an idea what direction they're moving. And the second thing I think I want to say on this is that quality countryside is not developed by proxy. You aren't going to have people on the outside doing this for us. And I think for too long, rural people have depended upon people beyond the rural community or People living in uh, Iowa, let us say, but not really in the rural areas, trying to help us develop. I'm trying to say the people themselves have to take the initiative. In other words, the people who live in the small towns and on the farms, they have the tremendous task of being a quality community. And unless people themselves are willing to be this, you're not going to get it. Brings up a very interesting point. We are not in control of the economics of our own community. And of course, this is the basic fact that uh, the National Farmers Organization was founded on. We feel we must develop a method of pricing our products, of pricing our services at the marketplace, and this would be step number one 
and establishing a quality community. Now we know a little, just a little bit, we got a short look at some of the problems as we see them. Uh, Dr. Mueller, uh, perhaps one step at a time, we could uh, say, what do we have to do here to, to help establish these quality communities? I would say the first thing people in the, uh, living in the uh, rural areas, and by rural areas, I don't mean just on the open country. I like to use the term probably countryside. And by the term countryside, I include towns of 10,000 and, uh, and less than our metropolitan counties. In fact, in a state like Iowa, you would almost include every, everything that is, uh, every community below 25,000. And the people in this rural sector, if they're going to build quality community, I think they have to establish for themselves some realistic goals. And as uh, far as I'm able to ascertain, people who live in the countryside seldom have uh, uh, goals in mind. And uh, I say this quality countryside isn't just going to happen. If it happens, it's the result of a good design. If you want to build a house, when you begin laying the foundation, even before you lay the foundation, before you get your material, you make some plans. You have an idea what this house is going to be like when it's finished. And I would say the same thing. Rural people should be getting together and thinking about what they want to make of rural America. Now, we have many good programs, educational programs. And some of the educational programs are self-defeating. And uh, I'm for them. But these educational programs, they increase the aspirations of young people, but they don't particularly zero in on the task of making it possible for these young people to stay in the countryside to fulfill these aspirations. So we increase the level of the aspiration of youth. And then youth to be able to fill these aspirations are forced to leave. We're going to have to have some goals so that they can, to a certain extent at least, achieve these aspirations in the, the rural areas. Now farmers particularly have received a lot of help how to be more efficient, how to produce food more efficiently, and how to have an economic unit. And this is very important. But they have not received too much help how they can build a successful community. Now, we need both. We need to help the individual operator to be successful. We need to have the, the individual businessman on Main Street to be successful. But they also need to think in terms not just being individual successes, we have to think in terms of being, having a successful community. And this won't happen until we make this our goal. This uh, preparing a community so that people can fulfill their goals, I think is one of the most interesting and one of the most points. We could discuss this, I believe, for hours. Uh, we've, we've seen so much export of our young people. We do instill in these young people a desire to lead a full life, uh, to achieve something with their life. And then to a great degree, we do furnish them a negative atmosphere out in the country or in our small towns. With, and it's just ab actually impossible for these young people with all of their drive and all their desires uh, to achieve what they want. So after goals, uh, we establish our goals in the countryside. We have the people of our local rural communities, our towns and small cities help us establish these goals. So what do we do about some methods then, Reverend Mueller, to methods to accomplish these goals? Well, we can say, I would say, if people have goals and if they have realistic, me if they have realistic methods, uh, they most likely will achieve what they set to do. Now, let me just uh, define some of the methods which I think you should give thought to. I think it's important that we have what I call grassroots philosophy. By this I mean that people themselves that live in the rural areas, the people who make up Main Street, who make up the countryside, that they should be the decision makers. And we have to come up with structures or organizations so these people can get together and decide what they want to make of rural America. Now, by and large, rural people have the capacity to make wise decisions. If certain things are there, they can make wise decisions if they have access to adequate information, if they have access to adequate facts. But you can't w very well make a wise decision if you don't have information. So one of the methods 
uh, ingredients of the method would be to provide rural people with the necessary information what it will take to build a quality community. And besides having facts, they also should be exposed to people with special knowledge. Well, I say I believe in grassroots self-sufficiency. I don't, I mean, well, I believe in grassroots democracy. I do not believe in grassroots self-sufficiency. That rural people are going to be able to do this by themselves in the sense of providing all the special techniques. Here they should be humble enough to seek out information from the best sociologists, information from the best economists, and uh, not necessarily take it at uh, face value, but explore this, examine it, pay adequate attention to it, but on the basis of their own experience, make their decision. This certainly brings up a challenging area. Uh, living on a farm all of my life, uh, I get a good look at uh, how farmers feel about some of these things that Reverend Mueller has explained to us. And I am deeply concerned about the people in rural America uh, making this information available to themselves and after they do get the information of utilizing it uh, in a beneficial manner. What type of people uh, is it going to take to accomplish such a thing as this? Uh, I, I believe it's a huge task. I think it's going to involve a lot of people. So what should we look for in the type of people will that will accept a challenge of this caliber? I think you raise a good word when you say the type of people because I believe it's possible. It's within the, the realm of possibility to build a quality countryside. But this is not going to be done by just ordinary people. It will take a certain type of people. And while the goals are important, and while methods are important, I would say the basic ingredient of building a quality countryside is the spirit of the people themselves. And uh, if people are indifferent and don't really take an interest, we're just going to drift from one chain to another, and we're just going to be in the constant process of transition. So it will take a people, I would say, number one, who have a desire to want to be responsible. And if you want to be responsible, then this assumes that you are accepting, that you are responsible to someone. And for me, as a clergyman, we need to be, have a sense of responsibility to God. I have the conviction that everyone is responsible for what he does with his life to God. And that, uh, and that this is not our world. This is not our countryside. This is God's countryside. And the question is, what does God want us to do with American countryside? It isn't just for us to exploit it. We ought to try to think in terms, what type of a countryside would really help people to be the kind of people that God wants them to be? So it will take people who want to be responsible. And the responsible people find a joy in living. They aren't the type that complain. They recognize their problems, but they recognize that they have a lo loving God in heaven and that they are his stewards, that he's on their side, and therefore they tackle their, their job with, with real zest. And they accept the responsibility that is theirs. So we have a mission, as it might say, as a Christian, to win, people in, in, uh, to win people to God. But we also have a mission as men. And our mission as men is to be, is to take care of God's earth and to make this to have a world that is pleasing to God. And along this line, we also need people who are willing to foster a spirit of goodwill. And uh, by that I mean you have a right to push your own self-interest in a responsible way but you are have an interest besides just your own interest. You have an interest in your neighbor. Now we hear much in our day about the fact that all people are created free and equal. But I would say here that all people are created free, but in one sense of the word, all people are not exactly equal. They have equal worth, but they don't have equal capability. Some have more talent and some have less talent. Some have more managerial uh, capability, others have less managerial uh, capability. In other words, we can say there's the strong people and the weak people. And the strong people ought to help the weak rather than exploiting the weak. But as I sort of uh, make an appraisal of what's happening in the countryside today, I'm afraid that there's a tendency for the strong, for the efficient farmers, 
for the man with real managerial ability really to exploit the weak. Now, how could the strong help the weak? Well, I would say here again, organization comes in so that we begin to join together and help each other. We have done this, for example, in an insurance company, like a fire insurance company. We help each other, mutual fire insurance company. We have done this in the soil conservation district. And I would say we also need to do it in the area, the economic area, so that we can build a sound economic base for the countryside. Now, there are many other characteristics I could talk about, and uh, I might just throw this one in. We need people who are forward-looking. In other words, by forward-looking, I mean people who are not afraid of change. Now, change is a part of life. Now, we don't necessarily be the blind, uh, uh, we aren't necessarily the victims of change, because the changes that are coming to the countryside are really coming because of choices that we have made. And uh, we need to anticipate these choices and need to learn to, to live with them. But not all change is necessarily good. Change is good if it is good for people. There's too much of a tendency for us to equate change and progress. And again, progress, uh, that is progress which is good for people. If changes come to the countryside which are undermine family life, which make uh, the life less meaningful, then I would say this is not progress. And we need people who are willing to evaluate change and uh, oppose the changes that are negative and be for the changes that, that are, are really positive and that give us and move us in the direction of, of quality. Some of the remarks you made uh, it takes me right back to the basic philosophy of the National Farmers Organization, the type of people that we do need on our land. Good, honest soil, soil stewards uh, that respect the land for what it is, uh, respect the land for its ability to pr produce food and fulfill a human need, God-fearing people uh, that just really, uh, in our opinion, in the NFO, certainly should remain on the land and be the stewards of the land. Uh, and in this movement of toward larger and larger farms uh, that are just by necessity, they command a tremendous capital investment. We are wondering how long we will have the family farmer, the individual farmer in control of this land. So now we have some goals outlined uh, for the rural people, very challenging goals. Reverend Mueller has outlined some of the methods. And he has also mentioned that we must have the proper spirit instilled in the people uh, out in the country to accomplish these things, to achieve our goals. So now, Reverend Mueller, uh, certainly when we talk about types of people, uh, we, we can explore this. Can we explore this much farther? Uh, we know we must have responsible people. We know we must have forward-looking people uh, that are willing to accept change for the good that it brings and resist change if they see that it brings no good. Uh, what more can we say about the people? What advice can we give them now? I think you brought up a thing which I like to call, we probably are to the point of facing a crisis situation. A crisis, I mean, where there is no, either we go one way real fast or else it's no hope for us. It's, it's a, and we're sort of reaching that point. Now, when people are confronted with a crisis, there, there's a tendency for people to do three things. Certain people, when they face this crisis, it scares them and they want to go back. They want to go back to the good old days and say, can't we have it the way it was back in 1930 or 1940? Then there's a certain group who get discouraged and say, what's the use? And they sell out. They run away from the problem. And they solve their own individual problem. But they don't solve the problem of the countryside. Then there is a the larger group that just simply drift. They feel that somehow, in some way, the problem will go away. Now, neither one of these represents responsible action. To go back is irresponsible. To run away from the problem is irresponsible from the standpoint of the total community. And to just drift above all is irresponsible. In fact, I would say to do nothing, to, it's better to do the wrong thing than to do nothing. To just to sit on your hands and feel that somebody's going to do something this is being the most irresponsible, this is the most irresponsible action that I can think of. 
Now, the responsible thing when a crisis confronts us is to, is to anticipate this crisis and full steam ahead. But to regroup our forces, to take an inventory of our resources, to get what knowledge, what information we can, and think in terms of what new structures can we create in order to be able to handle this crisis. This means that we need people who are also, who will take a positive attitude, who will take a positive attitude toward planning. Somehow, in some way, people in the countryside get the idea that planning is an evil word, a dirty word. But only the society that plans for tomorrow can anticipate to have a quality countryside because it isn't just going to happen by itself. And we have to take a positive attitude to working together with other people, with other communities, because it's bigger than one community, it's bigger than one county, and here we have to give some thought to finding ways of a number of counties working together, and with a farmer working together with Main Street and this larger community becoming a reality. In addition to this, we need people who are willing to face up to reality. Too many people who just drift aren't willing to face up to reality. They just think if they don't face up to it, that the realities aren't there. But they are there. And one of the realities is the economic reality. And this is the point where I come back to the fact we have to find some way in order to, to give people an adequate return for their labor input. And here I would, far, uh, would fault for the farmer and the businessman. They have traditionally been, as it were, against low wage, they've been, for higher, been against higher wages. But I would say this is, uh, hurts them. For example, if a farmer can hire a man to run his tractor for a dollar and a half an hour and can do just as good a job as he could do on that tractor, all he's worth when he's on it is a dollar and a half. But somehow he wants to pay the man who runs his tractor for him a dollar and a half, but he wants to sort of get two and a half when he runs it. This just isn't in the picture, see? And the same thing is in, in any other work. If we put a price tag and say labor so, is worth so much, then when I do it, it's worth no more. And somehow we have not been willing to face up to these economic realities. Now, I would have to agree that, that farms are going to get larger. And perhaps in the future, as we're going to have a quality community, agriculture in itself will not be the only economic base. And we need to think in terms of a state like Iowa doing more in the area of encouraging industry to develop, to supplement uh, agriculture, to, to supplement the economic base. But on the other hand, we do need to keep agriculture really economically sound because it's going to be the basic, as a, the main base for the economy of rural areas. Reverend Mueller, uh, we talk about family farms. We talk about farms getting too large, taking too much capital investment to be a family operation, and we talk about the feudal system of farming. I, I don't think any of us know whether uh, or how near we are to this type of agriculture, but would you briefly relate how you feel uh, the family farm structure is, is far superior to, uh, to a feudal or a landlord uh, tenant type of, or not a tenant, but a landlord peasant type of agriculture? Uh, I, I find a lot of farmers that say, this can't happen in our country because this corporation or whoever it might be just cannot hire their help as cheap as Ma and I can do our own work. So this can't happen in America. Well, I'll, it's interesting that you asked this question because just recently I uh, was in a rather leading restaurant in Chicago where I was discussing this topic with uh, two prominent friends of mine who are very influential in the agricultural picture. And I raised this question, I said it, put it this way, I said, I, when I watch these trends that we have in rural America, I'm afraid we're moving in the direction of perhaps in, by 2000, we're back to feudalism. And they said, no, this will never happen in rural America. And I said to them, I will believe you if you will tell me when and why this trend to ever bigger farms is going to stop. And they said, well, this we can't tell you. I say, somehow we assume again that somehow this trend to ever bigger uh, uh, farms is going to stop. But no one seems to know when or why. And this is what I mean again, but we're just in transition. Uh, and we have no idea as to how many farms we want in the Midwest. Do we want 10,000? Do we want 100,000? And uh, 
And I would say, first of all, we ought to make a base decision. Do we really think that the family type farming, as we have known it, an efficient farm unit operated by one manager, is a good way of providing food and fiber in view of the fact that the consumer is the best fed uh, citizen in the world and he's able to provide his family with the basic necessities of food and fiber for less cost than any other country, I would have to say at this point at least that the family type farm is far superior to any other pattern of farming that I know. And uh, therefore, I would like to throw my weight behind the family type farm system. And if we want to keep it, then I think the farmers and rural people and America as such ought to make this their basic goal and desire that we want to have a family type system in America. And if they want the family type system, then they're going to have to pay the operator of this family type unit an adequate return for his investment of capital and for his investment of labor. If we don't do this, there's only one thing that's going to happen. He's going to leave. This is one of several U.S. farm reports that I have helped with. It seems to me that Reverend Mueller has given our rural people, presented them with some of the greatest challenges, some of the greatest ideas, and some of the finest methods to go about solving their own problems. Uh, I want to thank you very much, Reverend Mueller. Is there anything more you'd like to say in closing? Yes, I would like to make one more point. And I would say, and I want to say this direct to the farmers, America, particularly the family farm farmers. They have a tremendous responsibility because it is within their power at this period in history see, to strengthen the economic base of the countryside. If they will fashion an organization, make a commitment to that organization, so that that organization can really do something for rural America. This has to be a strong organization where they, as individuals, make a commitment and where they stick with the organization. Thank you so much. It's been a very great privilege for me. U.S. Farm Report has presented Quality Community by Design with special guest, the Reverend E.W. Mueller, a staff member of the Department of Church and Community Planning, Lutheran Council in the United States of America, Chicago. Members of the National Farmers Organization invite you to tune in again next week at this same time for more facts on agriculture and rural America, which is the gear wheel in our economy that produces the majority of our nation's wealth. The National Farmers Organization represents new thinking in a new generation of farmers, for the farm income sets the pattern for the nation's prosperity. Tune in again next week at this same time for another edition of U.S. Farm Report sponsored by the members of the National Farmers Organization in this local TV viewing area.